Welcome to the Be Ruthless Show, where we have the conversations that other people don't, the conversations that other people won't. I'm your host, Sam Ruth, and I'm ready to make a lot of noise and disrupt things ruthlessly. Thanks for being here today. Now let's get to it. Welcome back to the Be Ruthless Show. I'm your host, Sam Ruth, and joining me today is Marty McNabb. Marty is a legacy artist who creates heirloom visual (laughs) visual narratives from her client's photo, document, and memorable collections. In other words, she tells stories with other people's stuff. She's fascinated by the stories that that get attached to these things. She's an interactive story sharing facilitator who helps people build deeper connections, community, and legacy by curating highly interactive public exhibitions and hosting gatherings about the things that matter. You can Mm -hmm. check out her show. I'll give you all those links at the end, but thank you so much for being here. I love what you do. Thank you so much, Samantha, and thank you for this opportunity to be on your show. How did this begin? (laughs) The big story. Um, So uh, Show and Tales or Things That Matter is a basically a second business concept, although my accountants would disagree with me. Um, (laughs) But that's another story. Um, But I it's it was a uh, second business after my first one, which is called Memories Out of the Box. Now, Memories Out of the Box is kind of uh, is on pause or on hold at the moment, because um, as you know, and I will share with your listeners, I am a digital nomad. And so I live part time in Vermont, part time in New Mexico with my wife and mother in law. Uh, And my mother lives in Vermont and then part time in a camper van named Brooklyn, uh, who just turned 100,000 miles. Um, So (laughs) which I guess isn't that bad for um, being five years old. But um, my memories out of the box business, probably I started it over 30 years ago. And the idea is that we take a lot of photos and we collect a lot of things in our life. Um, and we often inherit them um, from our loved ones who passed away, from ancestors who we may never have known, but uh, somehow their box was in the attic or the basement of a family home. So we have all of these souvenirs of our life story, of our journey through this, this life, and they often get stuck in a box. And I say, uh, your cell phone, this is a box too. Uh, um, it, it ha- it's smaller maybe, but it even has more stuff in it, um, more memories. And uh, so the goal of Memories Out of the Box was to get all of these photos and documents, um, these uh, visual representations of our lives um, back out into, you know, out into the day, you know, light of day and back into people's lives in some format. Um, Most of my clients wanted a good old fashioned scrapbook. Um, And I'm not talking about creative memories and the stickers and like the crafting aspect of it, which I love my friends who do crafting, um, but they're looking for um, more substantial visual narratives from these things. And so there's lots of hair and baby teeth and baby booties and the bracelet from, you know, when you brought your child home from the hospital, you know, all of leashes and and collars from our loved ones who of the fur persuasion um so all of these things i have um i loved for about 20 years creating visual narratives from them but getting to show and tales or things that matter as maybe uh you and your listeners uh, are aware if you are a solopreneur if you are a jane of all trades Um, one of the biggest challenges is marketing. And it's especially difficult when you are offering a service that most people haven't heard of. So I started show and show and tell actually over a decade ago um, in the back room of a good friend's uh, bar um, in uh, Prospect Heights, Brooklyn. And I there just invited people to bring any object, anything that had, 
told a piece of their story um, and to share the story. So I held that space for them to share their story. And hopefully I was, I mean, needless to say, I was a struggling business owner and the whole idea was to help build more visibility and credibility, uh, get to be li known, liked and remembered um, when people were thinking about what am I gonna do with all these photos? What am I gonna do with all this stuff? Um, and I hope that I would come to mind. So that's how this started over a decade ago. This touches me so much because I'm the person who saves things that are meaningful to me. So I could go get my papa's hat uh, that he wore, that I have, or I could show you something from my first date with Jim, you know, and, and some people will think it's silly, but to me, these things have so much meaning and mm -hmm. I could think of 20 more. Um, and, and we, why do we stop after school? Why do we stop show and tell? It's a great way <laughs> to learn and connect, but I love, I mean, I'm not attached to stuff. I'm attached to the memory. And so in this world, some people are on, some of those people are no longer here. Some of those conversations we don't have. So it's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the big thing. Like my, my podcast is called things that matter as you, you know, Sam, uh, Samantha, and it, it's, um, it, I always started off, I say things that matter with Marty McNabb, but it's not that the things matter. It's that the things were touched by people that mattered that were, were, were picked up during a time of, of trans, trans trauma, uh, transformation, some, something happened and you found that stone um, that you, you hold on to when you're feeling, you know, not powerful, not strong, like you're not going to make it through. Um, these things that we surround ourselves with um, tell a part of our story and help us tell that story. That's the other part is um, I know myself, I'm not great at getting a story prompt and just somebody asks me a question and me to just say the, like tell the story easily. But if I'm actually holding an object, a, a physical prop notice, you know, to speak, um, it just, the story starts like easily flowing for me. And I found it for several, uh, uh, I probably had over 250 of these um, events over the last decade. Um, it started all in person, but like everyone during, um, here we are uh, approaching the four year anniversary of the pandemic, right? And so like everyone, I I moved to a virtual events as well. And um, yeah, it's it, it these things have a way of, of holding these great stories like you're, the hat and uh, the thing from your first date. Yeah. And I'm going back to events where you are in a group and you have to tell an icebreaker or how do you get to know people? And again, if there's not a prompt, um, I use this with clients and groups all of the time. Give me a favorite, not with an object, but tell me your favorite memory of you know this or that. It's even a way to learn about ourselves. I'm now thinking of, I'm the tomboy. I'm the girl who, uh, you know, wanted to play sports all the time and have nothing to do with pink or girls or dolls. So my grandparents got me the Samantha doll. There was a Samantha. I think it was an American girl doll. Really? A big one and a little one. And I have the little one. That was acceptable to me. The little one to keep. <laughs> and I have it. But- Think about just getting to know each other with a stranger with just that. I could talk about being a tomboy. There's so much of an icebreaker, even with mementos or things. Uh, so I just love it. And you get all different. You get animal stories. You get. Yep. Yeah. I just, as I mentioned, I just ended up hosting an event for uh, Greenwood Cemetery so, you know, needless to say, it's uh, it's it every place has to market themselves and build goodwill in their community and uh, Greenwood Cemetery, historic cemetery in Brooklyn. 
Um, they have a death education program. And so I've been a, um, a thank, I'm so grateful to my friend, Amy Cunningham, who's a funeral director in Brooklyn, who I met through a death cafe. And she had been, been invited to host uh, workshops for Greenwood Cemetery um, years ago and did them quite often. But Needless to say, during the pandemic, the start of the pandemic, she got overwhelmed um, with um, uh, creating, you know, creating all the funerals um, there. Um, and so she reached out to me and said, "Oh, you do those things. Would you be be willing to to um, do some uh, show and tales for Greenwood Cemetery?" So I've done this now, well, going on four years, um, as I said, and the but this was the first time two nights ago that I offered it about um, our pets and pet loss, which is, as you know, you're much more familiar with the grief world is, uh, you know, it's like, oh, it's only your dog. Oh, it's only your, it's not, it wasn't, you know, oh, it's your own, only your uncle. It's, you know, all, all the onlys it's. And um, anyway, it was a powerful um, event uh, about these uh, fur fur family fur um, parts of our our support system our everyday you know like walking in the door and not having somebody greet you um, and uh, whether you were gone for you know a, a ten minutes <laughs> or whether you're gone for you know a week or whatever um, they're just so excited to see you and it's uh, so hard when they're gone. Um, so it was a wonderful experience that we had. I'm blown away by Greenwood Cemetery. That's fabulous. I yeah. am in the grief world. Yes. I have spent a lot of time over the last three to four years connecting, attempting to connect with hospitals, funeral homes, funeral directors. I've never heard of anything like this. Yes. So that's incredible. And I, I mean, that's what I want. It, that's how it should be. I, I didn't exactly. even get a pamphlet. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. fortunately so, I have my own resources, but not everyone does. Does. And, and uh, my understanding is the congressional uh, cemetery is also, also runs death education programming. I'm planning on reaching out to them as well. So yeah. Um, funeral homes have, are a little tough. I also tried, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're changing. It is happening with the help of people like Amy and you and me and Gabrielle Gatto, who's at uh, Greenwood Cemetery. I'm happy to make an introduction to uh, you, um, you both introduce, because uh, she has done some grief stuff, but there's always room for more. Um, and, uh, so yes, it's, it's, it's starting to happen, but it's, it's, uh, it's been a slow, uh, moving thing. Cause these are also family run. Most of funeral home yes. homes are, are independent and they're family run and they have done something in a certain way for a certain amount of time. And they've also had the help of a field that for a long time, uh, let the funeral homes do make all the decisions as opposed to the grieving families. But now with all this information, we've got families that are very clear about what they want in terms of the funeral and the celebration, the memorial, all that kind of stuff. So it the funeral funeral industry is moving and is shifting, but it's a little slower than than we would like. And what I learned when I moved from Michigan to Colorado is that it's different everywhere. So yeah. it might be happening in one place and not yet another. So if you are listening, even if this is three years from now, if you are a funeral director, if you work in that field, death education, people want to come in and volunteer. We're not asking to do anything to, to your business or your company, but that's a way to make a change. Any, any business owner listening. What can you do to help your staff or the people who will be coming in? This is where it needs to be going because people are traumatized. I get phone calls in the parking lot before people can drive home from the funeral home. Yeah. You know, so if we can do yeah. more and have more available, uh, even if you're somewhere that resists it, we can connect you with people who are doing it 
to find a way. We are struggling. And when we are in those places as the customer, uh, it it needs, there isn't enough support. There is not enough support. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, it's not, it's not um, a competition. It's, it, we're, we're not in competition. These are things that naturally, you know, what, what helps, like I, I coach somebody in doing a show and tales at her funeral home in uh, Pittsburgh uh, recently. And um, she invited um, her, her past clients, obviously they'd lost a loved one and they brought an object about that loved one and um, shared the story with, with other people who shared a loss. Um, and so, yeah, so, so it's not, it's not competition. Um, I'm, I'm happy to coach people and pass on my information. I'm not looking for thousands of dollars, you know, a couple of hundred would be nice, um, here and there when I, when I do it, but, um, but I'm happy to pass on my, what I've learned over the last 10 years to just like you said, like have more support and more, um, yeah, more uh, focus community. On, That's on how we heal. Community. Coming together with others who get it, and what I'm learning since the pandemic is that people have gotten used to this virtual world. So yeah. even now that there are things in person, when given the choice, some people choose virtual. So for healing, when it comes to loss, having something like that where you can be with others in a compassionate place. Who, others going through something similar it's so necessary it's not i don't know what people are afraid of there there's definitely fear connected but it does just help us heal it it lets someone else know that it's okay to talk about it yes yeah absolutely and it's and and there's multiple ways there's multiple ways that we can you know there's all different modalities and all different um ways of healing and, uh, and, and sharing, and sharing, sharing our stories, I think is as you, and you obviously believe deeply in that too, that the importance of sharing our stories. Is this why you have Brooklyn and you live the way you do? Is it so that you can go all over and do these things or was that in place already? So the the main reason for Brooklyn is because I lived in New York City um, in Brooklyn actually, and um, that's where she got that's her that's where she got her name from, and um, I I was kind of at the end of my rope in terms of um, uh, being able to fund my life there as uh, someone who like I started this whole thing off with the accountant. Um, saying, well, you need to actually make money to be in business. Um, so it, it can't be just a passion project. Um, but um, I was, you know, I, I had old appliances. Like it was like, you know, it was a fourth floor walk up. It was never going to be anything other than a fourth floor walk up. I was only getting older. Um, and uh, I finally got kind of in the space where it was like something had to give. And that's when I thought, well, I, I love Brooklyn. I love this area, but it was changing because of a major, um, uh, a major development in the area. Um, and so I was like, I think this is time, you know, to do, to, to leave, to, to move out. But then it was, the next question was, where am I going to go to? Yeah. After 28 years in, in Brooklyn, I was just like, where am I going to go? And so I knew I needed to sell. I hadn't really count, thought about getting doing a van life thing. But um, in that whole process, it started making sense that why not get a van, a little camper van, a class B RV, why not get one and then travel and spend some time in different areas? Speaking of Pittsburgh, my friend Christine, who's down there, Hanson with the funeral home. I have another friend, I, I have now a dozen friends in the Pittsburgh area. And I loved, I kind of fell in love with it. Um, so I was thinking of that, but then it was just like, you know, just use this, you know, take the, this opportunity to go and check things out and see where, where, where's home, where, where you feel the most connected and, and that you can make your next home. 
And so that's when I ended up getting Brooklyn. But that was also like a year and a half before I reconnected with um, someone I had met 30 years before and um, uh, who's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, so we, after 30 years, we started redating in actually May of 2020 or one of the um, 2020 love connection things. So, um, and that's when I was like, okay, I guess I'm not moving anywhere. Like I'm not getting an apartment in Pittsburgh or whatever. I'll just split my time between my mom who's in Vermont most of the year and here in Albuquerque. That had to be such a huge emotional leap. I'm thinking of so many people, friends and clients who want to do something like that. But the what ifs are also there. So how how did you say, I'm just doing it <laughs> and we'll <laughs> deal with them when they come? <laughs> well, I think that a lot of that comes from my early childhood into teenage years. So I moved nine times before I entered high school. So um, I... I, there's a certain trust in when, when you go through that over and over and over again, and you get, feel, you get to a point where you make new friends and you like, and you have a certain level of curiosity um, in life and, and not like, oh, poor me, like, why do I have, you know, like, it was a perspective thing for me. So I often um, have had people say, you're so brave. And I, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's sort of like the, um, you know, the idea of if, if labor was not painful, we would s still be in our mother's womb. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. It's just like, what I find is, is like, like I said, like literally it was like going up and down the subway stairs. We joked about how every time there's a covered ch charge, every time you walk out your door in New York city, that'll be 20 bucks. And then you go in and that's going to be another 20 bucks. So it was just like, and then all, you know, one after another, my appliances started dying. Right. So it was just, it was like, and the, the, the community was changing in a way that I was not really happy happy with and you know and uh I was looking at my bank account and and being like oh shit how am I gonna you know like so all of those things happened at the same time that was just sort of like I've got to take this you know leap of faith now needless to say I have a mom who is is you know um very you know very well off and she has a home and I always have felt like if worst case scenario happens I have her and I have that home um so I had a safety net uh without a doubt I'm not saying that she hands out her money all that freely um but it's definitely uh, a safety net um where I know there's a lot of people who don't have that um so I don't know what I would do because it's you know that goldfish thing what's water you know like I don't know what I would do uh, if I hadn't had that, but I oh. always have these things that like, and th then I'm like, okay, guess I'm going to have to, you know, like I'm more afraid of this and it's too painful. I've got to take the next step. And that's what happened. We connected through someone that I think is part of that community. You, you didn't just yes. do it on your own. You joined something. Yes. Yes. So I know I ended up uh, getting Brooklyn, my van, um, and, uh, that's going on five years ago. Um, and then it wasn't, it, I, I had not heard. So yes, Vanessa. So, um, I had, was unfamiliar with the idea of a location independent life or digital nomads or van lifers. I was unfamiliar with that term. I lived in New York City, like I didn't have a vehicle. So I hadn't driven practically in like uh, 20 years. I mean, I rented cars when I was out and about, but um, I hadn't uh, done anything like that. So, but it was during, it was actually during the beginning of COVID, right when I ended up, uh, I, I a friend had said something about, 
I want to interview you and submit an article to a location independent uh, magazine. And I'm like, a what? <laughs> And so I went and I, I Googled, it, so, and of course, uh, Location Indie came up is the name of their membership community. And so, and it just so happened that they were a closed community, M many communities closed for periods of time, but during COVID, they decided to open back up um, because we needed, all of us needed that. And so when I saw the email come in saying that they were opening their community, I thought, I was stuck in front of a friend's place in West Asheville, North Carolina, um, and uh, for the first 10 weeks of the pandemic. And she had a roommate, so I was mainly in my van. It was like, it brings a whole new level of BYOB. So it was bring your own bedroom, bring your own bathroom. Um, so I just parked out there and that's when I connected with Location Indie and um, uh, their online stuff until we were able to meet, I was able to meet Vanessa in person at Camp Indy, which is a, a summer camp for adults. So it's it's so much fun. Yeah, so. So I think whatever you're going through, if you're listening, finding that community, finding other people who know more, who might have suggestions early on, uh, that is such a big piece of it because even though you also, yes, you have your moms to go home to, you have a whole community of people doing exactly what you're doing who get it. Your mom doesn't have that. Yeah, that that's really true. And and yet one of the reasons why I really, really connected with Location Indie and Camp Indie, and then I just got back from a, um, a retreat in Mexico with this group of people is that we, it's not that we all identify as location independent, but we do it very differently. So I think as, as far as I know, there's only that I, you know, there's probably a bunch of people I don't know that they're not that active, but I think there's only a handful of us that live full-time or part-time in a van or in a camper. Um, the majority of them do full-time travel. Uh, they are bloggers or YouTubers. Um, a bunch of them work for a corporation, but now as, as long as they're in the United States, like it's hard to go to another because of the laws and, in, and insurance and taxes and all of that kind of stuff. But they work for a regular company, but they just uh, work virtually. So we're all kind of doing it differently, but that's the beauty. I I don't identify, like there's schoolie po population, there's van life population uh, groups and everything. And so many of them are, they've done their own vans. They've, they've modified, they've, you know, put in their plumbing and their electricity. They've, you know, put in the bed or done all the things. And I bought my mine fully done. I made one modification on it. So it's kind of hard for me to pull up in, um, in a Winnebago Travato into a van life place where everybody's done their own custom work, which is amazing. And I appreciate it. That's just not me. So that's why I really love Location Indie, the community, because everybody does it differently. But like you said, we, we, we're kindred spirits. I, I say we're weirdos. That's my target market um, because, and, and weirdos stand for where every individual remembers doing original stuff. I love this <laughs> so much. <laughs> I know you could relate, Samantha. <laughs> oh my God, I love it. And I just think whatever you're going through, having a, that community that you, and even though there's multiple, this is the one that feels right. We have to stick with that. Uh, we're in another community together. You are part of an upcoming book that I'm yes. so excited to have you involved in talking about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but for anyone who hasn't heard, Faces of Grief is coming out in December. What made you, what connected you, made you decide to do this? So um, it, I think it would be, I would say it's twofold. One is, is that Vanessa, anybody that Vanessa introduces to me is our my people like so it's an instant trust and an instant like uh with you um and then 
a belief in similar a belief in uh, the healing power of, of sharing stories. That was, you know, like right there, right from the beginning. Um, and I also, uh, in the last four years, a lot has happened, um, including reconnecting with the love of my life uh, and getting married because she needed to retire. So we had a shotgun wedding, uh, old people shotgun wedding <laughs> before retirement so I could be on all the paperwork. Um, and uh, my mom-in-law, we, we built an addition. Um, you know, there was just all kinds of things happening in, in all of that. Um, but at the same time, I started being becoming familiar. I have two friends that have been in multi-author books. And I, I just was like, huh, what are these multi-author books? Like I started like, re I mean, I know there's uh, older ones like Chicken Soup for the Soul. Like I, I, I now identify with it, but I wasn't, so I, it wasn't like somebody I knew ended up doing a multi, you know, uh, author book. And with, um, during this time too, I connected with someone who wrote, who created a book called What We Keep. Uh, his name is Bill Shapiro and his partner, Naomi Wax. And it was basically show and tell in a book form. And I had been doing show and tell as live gatherings, both in person and online. And everybody had told me, I need to create a book. And, but then I started thinking, huh, what if I create a series? What if I do a series of books? And that kind of has led, led me uh, to, to Vanessa, to you. I'm like, let me go through an experience first and, and, the, and, and have a little bit more of that before I go down that path myself or if I do or not. And then of course, um, as you know, with, uh, I, I, humans have a quick way of saying, I don't fit in. And so I did have this response of maybe I don't have a, as deep a loss, but the four years in, since COVID uh, started, I've lost 22 friends and family. It started off with my dad in February of 2020. And um, and that much loss and then that much change, traveling back and forth between Vermont and here. And by the way, for anybody listening, that's 2,200 miles uh, one way. So all of, all of this has made it made me aware that I have not really given as much attention to the grief and what that loss means to me. And I thought of your book as being this opportunity to, um, to look at that more deeply. So I thank you. Well, thank you for that. And I wanna compare it to Location Indie because while you might've compared, that's, that's the intent. It's not supposed to be all of these people with one kind of loss. Right. The world needs to, there are, we don't talk about grief at all. And that's the problem. That's why people stay stuck there and don't heal. So I want to include any and all. So mm -hmm. you're 22 losses. Some people, I don't think I've lived and lost that many people yet. I don't want to, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a huge story. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are living this through since COVID mm -hmm. and I can't tell it. They need to hear it from somebody who has. So uh, I was glad you shared that, but I'm glad we're talking about location indie to give a, you know, yeah. the point is to have a bunch of people who do it differently. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I, that's how I felt after the second call with you is like, okay, I am in the right place. How can people, what if they are thinking, oh my God, I would love for you to do this at my business or for this event, how can people find you? Um, yeah. Do you have to have a certain amount of notice? What's involved? Yeah, so um, they can find me at show and tales, and that's t a l e s dot com. Uh, my email is info at show and tales dot com. I'm on Instagram as show and tales, and also on um, Facebook. Um, I kind of 
get active and then get inactive. Um, but uh, I'm there. I share some of my adventures with Flatsy, my flat cat, who um, is uh, my travel companion. Um, uh, Cause everybody was like, you need a travel companion. And I'm like, I don't need one that I actually have would have to worry about right. um, getting out or is it too hot or too cold? So um, I do share some of those stories as I'm on the road. Um, that's the best way. And yes, um, I, I, I think that this uh, show and tales are a, an interesting way to build deeper connections and community and legacy um, because we're all going to leave things behind. Um, and those things will mean something to the people who are left behind with them. So um, I, uh, but I also see this, these events being perfect for a memorial, but they also can be perfect for a wedding and, they, and a family reunion, of course, and because uh, it's intergenerational, it's one wonderful to have, you know, a young person, you know, like show and tell from elementary school um, up to, you know, a great, great grandfather uh, or grandmother, um, you know, telling stories of things that matter. So it reunions, really there's the, it, endless, yep, so yep. many ways. So you are willing to talk to anyone about any of that? They just yes. reach out? Absolutely. I would absolutely love to have this opportunity. I have brought it to some businesses as well. I um, have uh, uh, zoomed in to a room um, where, you know, the people that work there are in the room and they all have brought their object um, and that went really well. Um, and uh, so I can do that if you, in Vermont or in uh, New Mexico or anywhere in between. I'm happy to stop sometimes on my on the road trip. Um, I will be at the Everything Conference in um, in Minneapolis, M Minnesota, the beginning of August this year. Um, so Everything Conference. It's for multi potentialites, people who like got thousands of ideas and it's like really hard to focus on a few. Um, I know Samantha and I can relate to, to those kinds of things. So Vanessa was the one who introduced me there. Um, and I'm also uh, part of the Quest 2024 uh, celebration uh, conference in uh, Rhode Island in person. And that is for women 50 plus who are looking at what life is like in their third act. Love it. All right. If you're driving, I'll put all that in the show notes. Any final thoughts for people listening? Last words? So last words would be um, take Samantha and my suggestion and share your stories. And if it's not in writing, which I've told Samantha is not my, not my thing, um, just share it, share it. Share it on video, um, send, you know, hold on to it yourself. If it's just for you, that's fine too. But if you have a chance, share it with someone or share it with other people, go to storytelling events and, and it really, stories can heal and do heal. And so I encourage you to share your story. I love that. And it's so true. Uh, everyone has one. You might think yours is not as important or as big as someone else's, but it is. And if it's something you want to share, there's someone who needs to hear it. So I love that. Thank you so much for making time in your nomadic life. And until <laughs> next time, everyone listening, always be ruthless. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Your support means everything to me, truly. If this podcast resonates with you, please do me a favor and join in the Ruthless Movement by making some noise and doing one of these four things. Subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Tell a friend so we can break stigmas even faster. Leave a review so people can see what you think of the show. And last, if you want to learn more about me and be a part of the Grief Hub community, please head on over to the Facebook group. We'd love to have you. Thanks again for spending your time with us and see you next week.